says in Ephesians chapter 5, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, making melody in our hearts to the Lord. So, you know, using our voice is, is, is one of the ways that we can express our, our praise and worship to God. Another way, though, that we can express our praise and worship to God is through our hands. And when you read through the Old Testament and look at the different expressions of praise in the Old Testament, especially in the Psalms, you're going to find these expressions about lifting your hands. Uh, there are several Hebrew words that communicate the lifting of the hands, and they don't all mean the same thing. For example, there's one Hebrew word that means to lift your hands in this position. And that particular Hebrew word means to boast in the Lord. So if you want to boast in the Lord with your hands, you lift your hand in this position. Uh, the, one of the words that's, uh, that we're very familiar with is the word hallelujah. And the word hallelujah means to boast in the Lord. Well, you can do that with your words or you can do that with your hand in worship. I'm boasting in the Lord right now. And then there's another Hebrew word that means the lifting of the hands, but it's a different word than the word that means boasting in the Lord. And it means to extend your hands in this position with your palms up. Okay? And so this is an expression of praise with your hands uh, to the Lord, extending your hands in this position. And what this particular Hebrew word meant, remember this one meant boast in the Lord? This, this one means that I'm thanking the Lord ahead of time for what he's going to do. Extending your hands. It's like opening your hands and receiving a gift. I'm, I'm, I'm using my hands to praise the Lord by extending my hands like this in order to thank him ahead of time for what he's going to do. They're both expressions of faith, okay? Both of them are expressions of faith. You know, uh, what I have found about my body is that a lot of times my emotions may be in one place, and I have to lead my emotions. And I have found that by, uh, through my body, whether it's speaking, extending, raising, or whatever, that my body, my emotions will follow my body. In other words, if I want to feel differently, if I began to praise the Lord with my words or get down on my knees in prayer or lay down on the floor prostrate in prayer or extend my hands or raise my hands, my emotions will follow my body, my physical body. And so I want to just encourage you, uh, worship the Lord in your private devotional life, worship the Lord when you come together congregationally in church, and express yourself to Him. And as you express yourself, you'll find your emotions will come into line with your obedience to worship Him. You know, you experience that all the time. I mean, you turn on music on the radio, you're feeling really down. You know, and then you start singing along with the song, and before you knew it, your emotions followed your body. And the same thing will happen as we worship the Lord, but even in a more meaningful way unto Him. Why church? Why church? I'm going to start this morning with a, with a story from uh, Matthew 21. Am I going to be able to see this up there? I am, aren't I? Great. And uh, the story this morning is found in Matthew chapter 21 and verses 12 is a story that I'm going to use this morning. And it's verses 12 through 17. If you want to turn there in your Bible or on your phone, then uh, I would encourage you to do, to do so and, and just follow along as I tell this story from God's Word. This story happened in the city of Jerusalem. And this story happened about a week before Jesus, the Son of God, Son of Man, was executed and crucified for the sins of the world. So that's when this happened in the life of, of Jesus Christ. And it happened specifically at the temple in Jerusalem. 
that when Jesus visited Jerusalem, he would many times stay in a place called Bethany. And Bethany was a, was a smaller town close to Jerusalem where he had family, uh, friends there, and he would stay there a lot of times, and then it was just a short distance to walk in to Jerusalem. And so I would think that that's where he was staying when this particular story occurred in, in the life of Jesus. Now, Jesus made a decision a week before his crucifixion to go to the temple. And when he went to the temple, and I think I have an image of the temple here. This is Herod's temple. It's called Herod's temple because it was built by King Herod. And <clears throat> Jesus went to this temple. All right? He went to this temple about a week before his crucifixion. And he probably entered up the south steps of this temple. And uh, the south steps would, uh, let me see if I can get this little thing working here, are, are on this side of the temple. This is north, this is south down here, and this is east, and obviously this is west. And so he entered up, uh, probably came up the south steps in, into, the, into the courtyard, the courtyard of the Gentiles. And when he, when he got up, and began to look around at what was going on in the temple, it was appalling to him. He didn't like, he didn't like what he saw. What he, what he saw was, was, this was leading up to Passover, and the city was filling up with people, filling up with Jewish people. And at Passover, they would bring sacrifices for their sins. And so what Jesus saw on the Temple Mount when he, when he, you know, got up there, was he saw merchandisers in the courtyard selling animals for sacrifice. And then another thing he saw was he saw money changers. Now, when the Jews went to buy a sacrifice that was going to be sacrificed for their sins, they couldn't buy it with Roman money. Because in Roman money, it had the image of Caesar on the money. And that would be, it would be defiled if they bought a sacrifice for their sins with money that had Caesar on the money. And so there were money changers on the temple mount in the courtyard, and they were exchanging money. And they were taking Roman money from the Jews and giving them Jewish coins, and then they would take the Jewish coins over to the merchandisers, and they were purchasing sacrifices, and this was all happening, and business was booming, because it was the week right before the Passover. Well, this couldn't be happening without the permission of the chief priest of the temple area. And why do you think they were allowing this to happen? They were getting some kind of commission <laughs> off the sale of the merchandise. And they were getting some kind of commission off the money changers. They were profiting their own pockets. And so here they were, the religious leaders, going through the motions of religion while they were basically robbing the poor in order to line their pockets with money. And so Jesus was appalled by this. And Jesus made a decision. And, and the decision that he made was, he looked around and he found cords. Now we don't know exactly what those cords were made of. It could have been leather cords that were nearby. It could have been an actual whip. Or it could have just been some rope that he found. But he, he picked up something that resembled a whip or cords. And you know what he did? He started driving all of these animals off the Temple Mount. I would assume they went out the south gate, Steve, went down the steps. That's what I would assume. 
He started driving them all out of the courtyard of the temple, out of the temple area. And as he did that, he started turning over the tables of the merchandisers and the tables of the, of the money changers. And so he made a mess. He turned over the, the tables, he turned over their chairs and made a mess. And drove them off. And as he was doing that, he quoted from the prophet Jeremiah. I think it's Jeremiah 7, verse 11. <laughs> and in that prophecy in Jeremiah, which Jeremiah was written about 500 years before this happened. And Jesus quoted from that prophet, Jeremiah, and he said, my father's house is called a house of prayer, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. Well, after Jesus did this and things settled down, people began to bring to Jesus friends and family members that were sick. And some were blind and some were lame. And he healed them all. Well, as this was happening, there were children who were observing this happening. And they began to sing a chorus directed toward Jesus. And the chorus was, Hosanna, Hosanna, son of David. These children began to sing, Hosanna, son of David. Hosanna means save me. And so they were expressing, these children were expressing their faith that, that Jesus was the son of David, the Messiah, the coming ruler of the Jews that the Jews expected to come and save them. Well, that didn't go over real well with the chief priest and the scribes that were nearby. They were already offended. Jesus had interfered with their economy. That has a way of offending people. But now, these children were singing praises to Jesus that were identifying him as the next ruler of Israel. And they didn't believe that. These religious leaders didn't believe that. And they didn't like it. And so they were offended. And they basically told Jesus to stop this from happening. Don't let these children do this. Well, Jesus responded to them with another prophecy. He was really into prophecy. And the prophecy was found in, in Psalm 8 and verse 2. And the prophecy says that out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants, thou hast ordained praise because of the enemy to make the enemy and the adversary cease. And that's all he said. And with that, he left the temple area and he went back to Bethany where he was staying. And that's the end of the story in Matthew 21. You know, it, in order to really understand the feelings of Jesus, which, you know, we don't have his feelings expressed like he felt this way in the text. But obviously, he was having some pretty strong feelings in order to pick up that, that whip and, that, and those cords and drive those animals out of the temple and overturn the tables and chairs. I know some of you ladies have seen your husbands do that at home. And you, you go, he's upset, you know? You know, you know he's, he's having these kind of feelings. And, 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 and Jesus was having all kinds of feelings within him and he didn't make his decision based upon those feelings. No, he, he made that decision based upon the will of the Father and based upon prophecy. Uh, one of the prophecies that he fulfilled was a prophecy said that 
when it came to the Messiah, zeal for his father's house would consume him. Consume. That's pretty, pretty much taken over, isn't it? And that's what Jesus was demonstrating in this story. But to understand the, the feelings of Jesus in this particular story, you need to understand some things about his vision for the temple. After all, he was the son of God and the son of man, right? And so the vision for the temple was his vision for the temple, right? He's the one who came up with the idea of the temple since he was God himself in human flesh. And so if you understand his, his vision for the temple, and we, we know a lot about his vision for the temple and temple worship by looking back into the Old Testament. Some of the things that we understand about God's vision for the temple and how glorious it was supposed to be is that the temple area was supposed to be a, a house, a house of purification for your sin. Just think about this. It was a place when the, when the Jews were cooperating with God and, and cooperating with his word, the temple was a place of purification, a house of purification. In other words, when you sinned, you could go there and find freedom. You could go there and you could bring a sacrifice. And you could confess your sin. And as you confessed your sin, you could offer this sacrifice for your sin. To make atonement for your sin. And your guilt, you could leave it there. At the temple. You could find freedom from guilt. You could find freedom from condemnation. And so that was, that was the vision for the temple. It was a house of, of purification. But not only was it supposed to be a house of, of purification, it was supposed to be a house of prayer. Not just for the Jews, but for all the nations, Jesus said. It, where anyone who had a need could, could bring their need to the temple and they could present their need to God in that place. And God had told the Jews, as long as you cooperate with me, if you pray toward this place or you come to this place and you, and you offer up prayers, I will answer your prayers. And so it was, it was intended to be a, a house of prayer where you could come when you were in need and you could receive hope. But not only was it a house of purification and, and a house of prayer, the temple was intended to be a house of power. Whew. Man, we see a number of living demonstrations of the power at the temple throughout the Old Testament. I mean, it was a place where healings were supposed to occur. Where you could bring one of your loved ones who was sick. And people, the priest could pray for your loved one. And God would heal and there would be power. There would be healing at the temple. And not only would there be power through healing... But tithes and offerings, when the Jews were cooperating with God and temple worship was what it was supposed to be, you could, they were bringing in all of this money. <laughs> I mean, incredible resources and leaving it at the temple. And those resources, a big percentage of them, were being used to distribute to the poor. And so when you had a financial need, you could go to the temple and you could get your financial need met at the temple. God intended for that temple is that it would be a house of praise. House of praise. A king named David, when he became king, he was the second king of Israel. He made a decision about temple worship. He decided that praise at the temple would be perpetual. In other words, it was going to happen 24-7, seven days a week. And he, and he organized, he organized musicians and singers 
and there was always a group that was on duty. And so what that meant was you could go to the temple and you would hear the incredible praise of all of these musicians and singers. So if you were down and you were downcast and, and you were depressed, you could go to the temple and you could hear God, Jehovah God, being praised by these trained musicians and these skilled singers. I mean, the temple was a house of joy when the Jews were cooperating with God. House of purification. House of prayer. House of power. House of of praise. You see, that was Jesus' vision for the temple and what it should be like for all of the people. And so when you have that kind of vision <laughs> and you walk into the temple and you see merchandisers selling animals for sacrifices and you see money changers exchanging money and making a profit off of it, and you see the chief priests lining their pockets off the money from, the, from what those people are collecting, you get a little bit upset, right? You get a little bit aggravated because the intention or the purpose of the temple is, is not being fulfilled the way the originator the creator designed it to be. Well, it was about a week after this that this same Jesus who cleansed the temple, who the children were, were praising, Hosanna to the son of David, God save us. He did. But not in the way that the Jews expected before he could come and rule over the nation and rule over the world, he first had to accomplish the most significant thing that's ever been accomplished in the history of mankind. He had to atone for the sins of mankind. And about a week after he cleansed the temple, the greatest cleansing occurred. He sacrificed his life by allowing himself to be executed on a place called Calvary. And in his death, he atoned for the sins of mankind. And he made a way for every one of us to have a personal relationship with God by removing once and for all the guilt of our sin. No more sacrifices need to be offered because Jesus, the God-man, made the ultimate sacrifice. Now, when Jesus made that sacrifice... He fulfilled the covenant that God had made with the Jews. And in his death, that covenant was fulfilled. And at the very same time, he began a new covenant. A new covenant. And the word covenant simply means this. Agreement. That's what it means. An agreement between God and man. And so in the first agreement, it was with the Jews. But when he died on the cross... God, through Jesus, established a new agreement with all of mankind. And in that agreement, it's better than the old agreement, by the way. In that agreement, if you will believe upon Jesus as the Lamb of God who died to take away the sins of the world, you can be freed from guilt you can be pardoned from your sin. What a deal. And so that was the first part of the agreement. And Jesus said it like this. He said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, the new agreement okay, between God and mankind. This is the blood of the new covenant which is, what's it say? Shed for many for the remission of sins. And that word remission means pardon. How many even need pardon for sin? Oh, man. I need God to say, you're forgiven once and for all. 
And what Jesus did through his death was establish this new agreement in which if you receive Jesus, your guilt is put upon him. And you no longer bear it. And you don't have to come back and offer sacrifices year after year for your sins at the old temple. And so that's the first thing that I want you to see in the new agreement that Jesus established. But there was something else that Jesus established in this new agreement. In fact, there were many things that he established in this new agreement. And the second thing that he established is there's a new temple. A new temple. And this temple is, there's differences in this, in this new temple. In fact, Jesus called this new temple the church. Oh, he didn't call it the church. He called it my church. In Matthew 16, 18, he said, here's the new temple. It's not the temple in Jerusalem. Here it is. And he told Peter, upon this rock I will build my church. And he called this new temple that he was going to build my church. And he said, the gates of hell will not prevail against my church. It's going to be powerful. It's going to be incredible, his church. But there's some differences and some similarities, but there's some differences that I want to point you to when it comes to this new temple. Okay? And here's the first difference. The first difference is this, is that this new temple in the new agreement is a group of people. Now that's strange. Normally when you think temple, you think building. You think place. But in the new agreement, the new temple is a group of people. Paul said it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I think it is. He said to the church at Corinth, do you not know that you are the temple of God? That's what he told them. You are the temple of God. And that God's spirit dwells in you. Now, if anyone defiles the temple of God, God will destroy them. Whoa. <laughs> because God's temple is holy, and you are the temple. You are the temple. Now, before you get all upset about being destroyed, here's what you have to avoid in order not to be destroyed. If we look at the context of this particular verse, He's talking about people who are coming into the church with false teachings. In other words, they're denying the gospel. And if you come in and you defile the church of Jesus with false teaching, you should watch out. You should watch out. Because God says right here, anyone who destroys the temple or defiles the temple, I will destroy them because the temple is holy. And then it says, though, you are the temple. And so the first difference between that temple of the old agreement and the temple of the new agreement is that the temple in the new agreement is a group of people, a group of people called the church. The second thing I want you to notice about the difference between the temple in the Old Testament and the temple in the New Testament is, and testament means covenant, okay, I'm sorry, is that the temple in the new agreement is a group of people that are united together around the mission of Jesus. Now, do you know the mission of Jesus? I mean, he was really, really clear with his first disciples about what their mission was. Before he had really convinced them that he was the Messiah, he called them. And when he called him, he said in Matthew 4, 19, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Right there you have the mission. Do you want to know the mission for you if you're a disciple of Jesus? It's to be a fisher of men. In other words, to be a disciple means to make disciples. And so Jesus said, here's the mission of this new temple. 
It's to make disciples. Now, he didn't want us to miss it. He didn't want them to miss it. So he not only told them that in Matthew 4, 19 at the beginning of the ministry, but at the very end of the ministry, he told them again. Before he ascended into heaven, where he rules right now over heaven and earth, he said to them in Matthew 28, 19 and 20, Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. So at the beginning, when he first called them, and at the very end, when he left them, he made it really clear to them, here is the mission of the new temple. Make disciples. That's it. That's why the new temple exists. It's a group of people who exist to make disciples. Paul said it like this in 2 Timothy 2.2. He was speaking to one of the disciples that he had made named Timothy. And he said to Timothy, Timothy, and the things that you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will teach others also. He was saying the same thing that Jesus said in Matthew 4.19, same thing that Jesus said in Matthew 28.19 and 20. The new temple is a group of people that exist to make disciples for Jesus. But then a third thing I want you to notice about this new temple is that the new temple in this new agreement is a group of people that is united together to make disciples of Jesus Jesus' way. I mean, Jesus, Jesus didn't leave anything out when it came to preparation for his new temple. He modeled for the new temple the way we're supposed to go about making disciples. What did he do? Well, in Luke, it says that he went up on a mountain to pray, came down off the mountain, and chose 12 guys to be with him. And what did he do with those 12 guys? Well, he, he shared life with them. It wasn't, hey, I see you over there on Sunday. I'll see you next Sunday. No, he shared life with them, right? He lived life with them. And what did he do with those 12 guys? He shared truth with them. I mean, he was constantly telling them stories. And the purpose of those stories was to bring to the light truth that they needed to hear. And a lot of times, those truths that he shared with them from stories was based upon one of their failures. I mean, they were incredibly transparent with each other. They shared truths with each other. And not only did they share truths with each other, but they shared love with one another. I mean, they were constantly serving each other, looking after each other. So Jesus gave us this model for the best way to make disciples. And it wasn't church in rows. It was church in circles. Church in circles. Not church in rows. But church in circles. That was his method. Makes sense, doesn't it? Why church? Well, why church? It's because the church is the temple of God on earth today. The church, the church of Jesus, is the hot spot for God's presence. In the Old Testament, at the Old Testament temple, that was the hot spot for God's presence on the earth. God chose a people, and then he chose a hot spot. And it was called the temple in Jerusalem, where he would manifest his presence to the people. And there was, there was, there was uh, purification, and there was, there, was, there was prayer, and there was power, and there was praise. And now we've got a new temple, the church of Jesus. What's similar is, is that he wants the same thing to go on among this temple that went on in that temple. He wants there to be purification. He wants us to be leading other people to the knowledge of him. You can't make disciples until you first make converts. And he wants us to lead people to receive him as that sacrifice for their sin. It's a place of purification. It's a place of prayer where we unite together, not in rows, 
but we unite together in circles and we pray together as we go through the struggles of life together it is hard life is hard but he wants it also to be a house of power and he promised power to his church if you abide in me my words abide in you oh man there's all of these prayer promises that are given that we should be seeking him constantly and asking and as we ask there's going to be those times where bam power God answers our prayer and he wants it to be a house of praise a house of praise you know uh, they sort of missed it in that Old Testament temple there's some guys who came up with a better idea and they said we're going to do it our way we're going to run this temple our way rather than doing it God's way I wonder if the same thing has happened in the church of Jesus and the temple today And I wonder what would happen if we would go, you know what? I accept this. You and I, we're the temple of God. God's spirit dwells in us. I am the temple of God. And we exist, you and I, we exist to make disciples for Jesus Christ. Period. That's why we exist. That's our purpose. And then we're going to do it his way. I wonder what would happen. I wonder what the Holy Spirit would do if we would just surrender ourselves to be his temple. If we would unite with his temple. If we would do it his way. I mean, if we'd really start sharing life together. Sharing truth together. Sharing love together. Not one time on Sunday morning. But throughout the week. Oh, I've got my family. I don't need y'all, church. Is that what the word says? Aren't you doing exactly what they did in the Old Testament when it came to temple worship? You're saying you got a better idea? I mean, is that what Jesus said? I mean, when his family came to him, looking for him, and they were told that he was at, they were outside. What did he say to them? He said, hey, those who believe in me, this is my mother, my brothers, my sisters. You think he, he got it? No, you need the temple. You need the church of Jesus Christ. I wonder if you've ever received Jesus as a sacrifice for your sin. Have you really believed on him? Not because maybe you were an American and you were taught this growing up or whatever, but because the Holy Spirit has convicted you of your sin and he's been calling you to receive Jesus as your personal Savior and Lord. And perhaps that's even why you're here today. Is he wants you to receive him right now. I want to give you the opportunity to do that in just a moment. But church, listen to me. Those of you that are already members of the temple, in, in 1 Peter, I think it's chapter 2 and verse 5, Peter called this new temple, he called the individual members of it living stones. Living stones. In other words, in order to be the temple the way God wants the temple to be, I'm a member, I'm a living stone, and I've got to be connected to other living stones in order for the church to experience what God wants the church to experience today. I'm asking you, I don't know what's keeping you from being connected to the new temple, the church of Jesus. But I want to encourage you, whatever it is, deal with it. 
Lay it down. Surrender it. And become a part, a living part of the new temple of Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. First thing I want to do is give an invitation to those of you that need to receive Jesus this morning. Right now the Holy Spirit is